Good evening. Welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm Jorge Otero Pailos. I'm a professor at GSAPP. Mark Wigley is uh, traveling today, so he couldn't be here. Um, w Magazine recently published an article titled, Where in the World is David Ajay? Well, if you have cell phone reception, you can use that hashtag to tweet that he's in Wood Auditorium. Um, David is here. He's here at a very important moment in his career, uh, but it's also a very important moment in the history of the United States. He's about to begin what w uh, a building that will complete Washington, D.C.'s National Mall, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it is somehow fitting that a building inspired by a traditional African headdress will represent the crowning achievement of America's symbolic center. With it, David has joined the ranks of the world's best architects, the names like I.M. Pei, Gordon Bunshaft, and Paul Crett, whose accomplishments were not just, and I we have to put just in quotation marks, just to build on the mall, but to help redefine architectural practice for their generation. And that is no small feat. But David has the gift of making things that are really hard appear to be easy. And it made me think that, um, in a past life, he must have been an Olympic gymnast. But that was, of course, until I saw him walk in in crutches. <laughs> um, he's led our generations turn away from the grand iconic gesture and away from the dominant baby boomer conception of architecture as what Saskia Sassen has called a hermetic dialogue between art and money. Instead, he's endeavored to elevate the idea of service above the contractual obligations that we have to the desires of our clients to include the broader needs of society. Most of you know that he's won the prestigious Designer of the Year Award last year, and that really attests to his influence beyond the confines of our discipline. He's always in dialogue with other disciplines, interpreting the work of architecture for uh, artists, scientists, politicians, thinkers, and also interpreting those disciplines for us. His buildings recover the discrete values of modesty, of quality, of simplicity in the service of the public interest. For example, his Museum of African American History and Culture turns away from the temple on a pedestal form to engage the street directly and frankly. Like the rest of his generation, David internalized the criticism that architecture alone cannot improve social conditions. But he's distinguished himself for proving that architecture is an essential participant in a multidisciplinary struggle to advance a more equitable world. I say world because David's practice is both worldly and global. His worldliness has in fact helped redefine what it means to work as a global architect. For him, it's not a matter of following market demand but rather of calling our attention to the blind spots in the emerging global vision. His research on Africa's role in globalization um, and Africa's role in the globalization of architecture, and not just now and in recent years, but also Africa's role historically in this process, is sure to have a long-lasting ramification within our field. We're privileged and pleased to have him here tonight Please join me in welcoming David Adjaye back to our school and to this podium. Thank you, Jorge. It's very nice to be in Colombia again. And um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm on crutches, so I'm going to have to sit down. Um, it's a temporary injury and annoying. I wanted to um, take you through a few scales, and just to say that the last, uh, the past sort of uh, seven, seven, six, seven years have been a very interesting change for the company, where um, a lot more research has been taken on board, and we've been lucky enough to be able to share that research with, um, with, uh, with the profession, but also um, to be able to take on longer projects, larger projects very large projects for the first time um, in the practice and be able to realize them, which has been a complete learning curve for us. Um, so I, in a way, wanted to show several, several scales in several uh, places, but also to, in a way, I hope, 
by sort of the way in which I've curated the sort of uh, pieces of work that I'm going to show you, also show how things fold and overlap and, and support each other. I sort, of, I sort of deliberately set up the practice in a way so that it always, as it were, almost as you fold a blanket, it, um, it always reinforces and helps the center, always kind of reapplying um, things that are learnt in apparent uh, periphery back into the center, which helps the production of public buildings, which is the heart of the, the whole thing. Um, something that has been very important to me um, was to really do this study over 11 years uh, of really looking at um, architecture. And what's really been very interesting with some people who've seen this book is that they thought I was talking about cities. And in a way, I'm, I'm, I wasn't. I'm very interested in cities, but this book is, this, this survey that I did was really about geography and architecture and trying to kind of go back to certain fundamentals about that. Um, so in sort of spending 11 years crisscrossing the, the continent of Africa, and visiting every capital city, specifically every capital city, because of the, in a way, by being a capital, there is this idea that there is a design, and then there is this kind of production that somehow symbolizes some kind of nationhood. But um, because of the way the continent's colonization has um, sort of mapped out, um, the different lingua franca never talk to each other. So the, even though it's one continent, it really is fragmented into these very four disparate parts, both in terms of transport and language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's been this kind of blindfold to building imagery. Um, at the beginning of the sort of nation building agenda, there was a lot more communication, but then sort of I think in the 70s and 80s, it sort of became very much blindfolded and separated. But at the same time, there's been this production of architecture, form and topology specifically, um, which has somehow been consistent. And it's been consistent not to a sort of an idea of nation, but to place, specifically place, which sort of talks about the enduring um, nature of place. Um, obvious, obvious thing to say, but somehow you think that with a continent which has divided itself now into 54, this is an out of date map because there's a new country just here, um, which is South Sudan with the capital called Juba. Um, you know, you would think that there would be a struggle for 54 identities, 54 sort of nation. Nation, national ideas, and you know, uh, we sort of talk about the continent of Africa really being 50 years old in terms of finally grasping its own sort of political identity. So within 50 years, to kind of emerge specific um, new uh, sort of identities is really a kind of false premise to really understand this, and you have to understand the history of the continent in terms of its trajectory being really about kingdoms, um, very large sort of um, northern northern, central, and um, southern kingdoms, which were large agglomerated bodies of different tribes, um, uh, and, and then became fragmented through colonization, et cetera, and the sort of tribalism that occurred um, sort of from that into more smaller groups, and then the imagery we know now. So this reforming of the continent, first into, I mean, this is the map of, uh, this is a colonial map, this is really the Berlin map of 18, uh, was it 1857 or what is it? It's um, the colon There's a very beautiful drawing of the sort of the colonial powers sort of carving up Africa in that sort of room, and that's more or less the map um, which was made. And in a way, to start there is really the mistake. Um, that's the continent for me. Um, so when you get rid of the boundaries, you really have three. Uh, you have really six, if you analyze it much more deeply, six specific conditions. Um, but really, this is really the phenomena of the place. And this is this incredible, stark, contrasting phenomena, which then makes a very kind of particular set of cultures, which has produced um, sort of all the things we know. The sort of river cultures, river and forest cultures, are where sort of most of the tribes that we know have always congregated. So the river cultures are all in West Africa, which are land-based farming cultures. The nomadic cultures are here. This is where the animals are generally. They're um, uh, the sort of... Uh, nomadic sort of northern desert tribes obviously here and then the southern sort of Zulu tribes, uh, Swazi tribes down here. These are the, that, that image really comes, becomes these six specific terrains geographically and we know this, I mean the words that we used, people used the Maghreb not even realizing it actually means the geographic terrain, it's not a political term. Um, but these very kind of specific contrasting landscapes are what kind of defines that 
that that terrain and and I think once you have that picture lodged in your head I think you can start to really understand that you're really talking about this and I think when you start to understand it like this you you understand that that um, there may be many countries they may be blurring across many boundaries but really it's about the response to these six climatic conditions um, I could do a lecture where I'm just going to talk about that but I just wanted to quickly just give you that summary and to just put that into your mind because in a way that kind of concentration on specificity always of place is what always unfolds in the work generally um, in the practice. So looking at the mountain high vaults, this is the most temperate climates. Um, there are about 10 countries in those temperate climates going from north to south specifically. And um, they have a certain kind of familiar sort of image of sort of very temperate you know, co um, slightly sort of breezy hill towns um, that are sort of, uh, sort of in a way more, less specific climatically in terms of their architectural response because in a way they can be more general because of the temperature range is, is much more soft. And then you have something like the savanna, which is this um, moment which tracks to West Africa and comes right down to South Africa, which is the migration pattern from Botswana going all the way to Dakar. Um, originally, I mean, the migration now turns somewhere here, which is this horizontal plate of very low foliage. Um, and really, when you look at this landscape more specifically, a certain architecture which is um, horizontal within, you know, with the exception of places like Pretoria, which is a specific, almost sort of uh, classical imposition within that valley. Um, a, a very sort of European plan which is in that valley. But even at the same time distorting to that landscape, um, you have this kind of horizontal shifting within the landscape which is uh, very precise and where there's a kind of undulation where places like Ananata Rivo in Madagascar, um, which is a francophone plan on this extraordinary hill, you have these extraordinary cuts, San Francisco-like, but all kind of pedestrian walkways which go up and down, up and down this landscape. And then you get to um, the forest, which is where the predominant um, amount of countries are. And the forests are where it's the river culture, where all the, sort of, all the sort of tribal cultures that most people probably know are all based in this forest belt. And it's really because of being based on the land, um, having a culture which kind of derives its essence from being completely connected to the cycles of nature, to farming cycles, and to the ritual cycles that are associated with that. But the, suddenly the foliage moves from this horizontal low shrub, which is really a plant, a sort of animal shrubbery, to this very dense canopy system. And then you have this thickness which occurs where you really are in the garden city. Um, and you're in this absolute uh, verdant landscape, and uh, it's moist and it's super hot. And if you're exposed, it's incredibly dry and hot. And if you're in the garden, it's, uh, it's much more temperate. Um, and in a way, the more successful cities mix this combination um, very specifically. And the architecture plays a very interesting role in that, where the blurring, where nature and the architecture play much more kind of um, diaphanous relationships. And the more imposed cities, you know, that kind of try to defy that really have a kind of hard time with these buildings, which wear down very quickly, but sort of have also a certain specific quality. This is the tallest tower in Africa. Um, and it's in a small country called Brazzaville, and this is the Congo River, the mighty Congo, which is like the Mississippi, um, which sort of divides the two things, and it's the sort of the bank, it's the, it's the bank building, of course. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing that you're sailing up the Congo, and then suddenly you get the skyline, and there's this extraordinary um, sort of 60-meter um, tower that's sort of in the middle of nowhere. So this is really looking at the forest. You can see how the forest changes as it also gets to the islands and also where it hits the coast. I mean, um, when it's in the thick landscape, it really is specifically very much wedded into the land. And then when you get to places like Luanda or you know Malabo, which is an extraordinary little settlement, or even Maputo, where these coastal moments or the most fantastic island in uh, the uh, Indian Ocean near Madagascar, the Comores, which is a, on an old volcanic um, sort of uh, place. I think one of the most extraordinary places in Africa that I didn't know about. Um, a sort of Nubian city 
um, very close to Zanzibar. Um, you have this extraordinary sort of change to this appreciation of the kind of coastal, coastal idea. But even right through to the Seychelles, you get this sort of something that you see more in the Caribbean, I think, this sort of uh, almost island-ish uh, architecture happening at the edges of the forest. And then when you go to the Sahel, and you're coming into the extreme sort of temperature at the Sahel, um, which is the edge of the desert, you have four countries in that, and they're all different, um, different groups who very rarely talk to each other. We've been doing a project where we've been delivering art, pro art installations to different parts of the continent and trying to talk about the imagery of the architecture to each other. And in Ouagadougou, we were talking to them about Naomi, and the mayor was getting confused with his own city. He thought Naomi was his city, because the imagery was so similar to him. Um, it, was, it was kind of striking. He'd never actually acknowledged the kind of morphology of the city. Um, so when you suddenly come to the Sahel, where you get the edge of the verdigree and the beginning of uh, the desert, you have this very sort of dry, climatic architecture, the sand architecture it starts to be, it starts to kind of take over. And um, you get this, you know, in the Francophone plan, you get these massive boulevards and very diminished buildings. And then um, uh, you sort of get where there's been a mix of colonial powers. You get sort of this sort of landscape, English landscape idea, which where you have sort of buildings weaving between, um, between the sort of uh, the vertigree. In the desert, of course, you have very little habitation in the center. You have habitation on the coast and on the River Nile, specifically. So you have um, two cities on the Nile and two cities on the coast. And so you have a very kind of extraordinary image. And you're coming into um, the sort of northern part of the continent where you have the Medina culture and the old civilizations which interact. Oops. How do I take the control off? <laughs> um, that interact with um, the sort of the coast very specifically, or the river, uh, the river becomes the very important um, um, sort of articulating element. So this is Cairo. This is the sort of, this is the Nile going down. And this is the, the junction of the white and the blue Nile, where, they, where it splits into two. So this is Khartoum. This is the top, and this is the bottom. So this is Upper Egypt, and this is Lower Egypt. And then you have Djibouti. This is facing the, um, um, the, um, facing the Middle East, of course, and this is facing the Atlantic. Um, this is now Chat um, in Mauritania. And then you have the Maghreb countries, which are Really, the Maghreb being this cluster, people start to put Egypt and all these countries in the Maghreb. The Maghreb is this northern culture which starts to touch Spain. And this, this little moment in the Mediterranean is really the Maghreb. And it's really because specifically these four um, cultures have at the heart of them the Medina, the old Medina um, structure. So it's one of the few parts of the continent where you understand the old um, history of the of continent as well as the, moder the modern culture. It wasn't destroyed in the kind of colonization that occurred. So you get very powerful um, architectural landscape and a kind of a much stronger continuity, which um, doesn't just sort of um, come from um, um, the sort of late 19th century. So you, you're getting things which are going back. Um, this is the old quarter of Tripoli, um, you know, back to the 10th century. Uh, Tunis, Algiers, um, looking over the kind of coast of Algiers. This is sort of Le Corbusier's famous drawings. Um, where the old part is sort of deep in the heart, which is this incredible harbor. And Rabat, which is really a kind of inlet with two cities on two sides. Um, but this idea of these sort of, uh, in the Maghreb, seeing this overlap of the old city and then the rings of modernity sort of radiating away from it. I kind of wanted to put that in just as a, as a sort of a, a quick overview, because in a way those geographies, even though they are in Africa, also in a way, sort of have guided the sort of the certain strategies to projects that we're now doing which are not necessarily always in urban conditions. Some things are and some things are very much not. And two projects I'm going to show you are very much investigations of landscape. Um, uh, this is a project in Ghana. This is the, uh, a very big project that we're working on right now. Um, we're sort of starting to establish a sort of strong pro presence in Ghana. My family's from Ghana. 
Um, and there's a kind of huge economic growth happening in West Africa right now, in Lagos, Ghana, um, even um, 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 Ivory Coast, and then up to Dakar. So there's a kind of, a, uh, and then Togo and Benin, the smaller countries are also kind of booming. And, and of course, as you go down to Gabon, um, uh, to, um, to Angola, um, you have extraordinary growth that's sort of occurring, um, sort of in Central and West Africa. Um, so you'll hear more of these names as these countries sort of uh, explode. I mean, there's sort of double-digit growth, sort of 12 and 15 percent growth, which has not happened because of oil and gas. Um, Almina is in this forest belt. It's in Ghana, of course, as I said, which is just here. It's a very famous part of, um, uh, of, of Ghana. There's a very famous uh, fort there. It's, where, it's the fort that Obama went to um, uh, when he visited Ghana. Um, and so it's a very famous slave fort that's very close to it. But it's also very famous for, um, this is sort of uh, Cape Coast. This is the road. Takrada is here, Accra is up here. It's a sort of network of roads that bring you through. The site is just here. Uh, off a very uh, sort of a, a lagoon, the coastline is here. Sorry, these slides are a bit washed out because there's blue on my screen. This is the ocean just here. Um, this is the architecture of the forts. This is Elmina. This is the very famous slave fort that brought um, a lot of uh, the African-American community and also the community in South America to the New World. Um, so these are sort of details of that, sort of the towns that sort of wrapped around that. Um, but also in these places are these, uh, just in those suburbs are these extraordinary schools. Um, what was kind of interesting was that there's a very kind of a, a big exchange within the English colonies with, the Eton, with Eton specifically. A lot of Etonian professors were sent down to West Africa. So a lot of very high education um, environments were made and a lot of uh, sort of, sort of uh, exchange was made between the sort of education of the West and the education of West Africa. And so these very interesting schools where a lot of the sort of intellectuals of West Africa are, are trained are, came from these sort of contexts. You know, very typical quad ideas, but in the sort of uh, responding to the sort of colonial uh, climatic. But also with that, again, as I was saying, um, um, the traditional, this is, this is looking at Central Africa and this idea of the kind of the relationship to um, sort of um, the oral traditions which are passed under specific places, and then going up to the Maghreb and then transferring up, even looking at the way um, citadels, uh, Granada is very important, the landscape is sort of applied as something that one wanted to work through, how you start to um, understand how to um, um, contextualize this landscape and also to contextualize the tropes of this place to start to understand, to make a specific language. I mean, in the forest region, what I started to uh, um, really specifically hone in was that, in a way, one had to respond in a way the geography was responding, which was that the landscape presents um, to the habitation on the ground a forest carpet, a high plain vegetation plate, which stops the heat getting down to the bottom, and then the life happens in the forest. So in a way, maybe a way to start an architecture was to literally mimic that geographic phenomena directly and to see if one could then start to talk about a kind of an architecture that could make this response in this kind of landscape. Um, because it's very close to the equator, it's almost equal. There is no, uh, you're missing all the geography bits, but there is no um, um, south or north. It's perfectly symmetrical. <laughs> and um, so we said, what can we make a project where we almost um, invite an entire landscape? This is a college, um, a sort of upper education college for, for kids. Um, so the idea is to really make this very, very large um, quad, which is, um, or cube rather, which is an elevated piece of landscape with um, a sort of uh, all its kind of water retention systems and its planning for its uh, infrastructure sort of in the land, but really to take a piece of land that we lift up uh, 10 meters world underneath it which pixelates a series of apertures which allows a series of courts to um, um, create um, uh, 
microclimates and then obviously to use uh, water etc to kind of try and deal with the sort of harsh solar gain and louvering to sort of deal with the so this is kind of three-story buildings are under this large infrastructure plate it's this pre sort of precast concrete sort of structure that we've been developing with our engineers um, where you can have access but it's a kind of landscaped superstructure on this uh, large grid and then very simple set of buildings are sort of put up underneath and can be taken up or taken down but the the first thing that's built is this kind of massive infrastructure plate to sort of deal with uh, that context. The plan is very simple. Um, it's really a kind of off the highway. There's a kind of drop off, large drop off point. There's a refectory, there's an outdoor auditorium and um, spaces for sort of further development. There's a pool, gym, sort of a sports area. Then the sort of classrooms are on this side. The roof is um, you can see the sort of cutouts of the roof and the sort of relationship between this, uh, the buildings that are slipping inside and some of the loggia systems that we're developing. And then this is a landscape which can be used for games, etc. This is a um, 400 meter uh, plate. So these are just some early studies to look at um, how that superstructure would work and, and how that sort of uh, world underneath it would be. So in a way you basically make this very direct very strong structure which supports um, this world up above. It makes um, it makes the microclimate like the forest. It tempers the sort of environment and allows the sort of microclimate that's created underneath to suddenly start to work. And then you start to landscape it. This is just kind of quick scale scale studies that we're testing. So this is looking at these sort of outdoor auditoriums, looking at the refractories, looking at the sort of systems. So you have this blurring of inside outside and that's what I'm calling a sort of infrastructure which is uh, moderating this sort of space. And the idea of architecture per se is kind of blurred right down to almost just being a generic non-specific condition which can be, can be there or not be there. And then these are some earlier studies starting to look at how that could start to um, sort of manifest itself um, as we sort of start to kind of develop it more. We're, we're hoping to get on site um, this year with this project, where it's, we're um, sort of in the working drawings right now. What's kind of amazing is that you can build large infrastructure projects, infrastructure looking projects on the continent because of the um, different um, labor model. So you can actually do things that you think you can't do elsewhere which has been something that we've been very interested in kind of taking advantage of. So this is looking at possibly the future development of the entire thing, is that you could actually start to inhabit and build more as you grew and you could start to inhabit the entire roof as the sort of school works. So a different model of planning is occurring where instead of kind of growing out, you're growing densely onto the, onto the superstructure, which allows for many things to happen on it. Um, whilst that project was happening, another project was happening in, in, in Russia. This is the School of Business and Management, which is, was on the image, which is the thing that was published recently in the architectural record. This has taken us about six and a half years to complete this project. And we won this um, in the early, sort of around, I think it was 2000, 2003, we won the competition. It was completed in 2010 um, and really opened in tw 2011. And so you sort of move from the equator to the north here and to Moscow. This is the Moscow River. The site is here. The density of the city that you know is just here. And um, the sprawl of Moscow, which is a little bit like Milan. It's a series of concentric rings. I think I have a plan. Yeah. That's Moscow River. Center, where the Kremlin is, is just here. So the traditional heart is here. And then you get all the kind of rings, the Stalin ring, the Brezhnev ring, and they sort of wrap around, and each one sort of has a super highway that takes you right around, and the best way to get anywhere is always to come that way and never to try and go across. And we're in this ring, which is the la latest development ring, sort of the Putin-Medvedev ring, where all the new tech and industries are occurring. Um, and this is where the airports are. Uh, our site is here in um, the southwest. Um, it was, so let me just quickly give you some imagery. So that's the center of Moscow, the Kremlin, and so the Moscow River. And this is looking at one of the rings, this is Brezhnev's ring, where the sort of super housing 
projects were made um, by extraordinary architects and engineers. You know, whether you like it or not, there were kind of very interesting engineering ideas about mass housing, which were fascinating. Um, the site is on the edge here. Um, so this is, this is the sort of sprawl coming. Moscow is here. This is, this is the site here. It's a 27-acre field. I put this here because we discovered this is a very important cemetery. Um, Malevich is buried here, which I found um, out about when we were working on the project. Um, site, so it became very interesting about the history of Russia, Moscow, and this man being very close. Um, and you can see the sort of, the way in which the solar axis works. It's that way. East is here. Um, um, what am I talking about? North is that way, east is that way, west is that way, and this is the southern axis just coming around. So for uh, three months, it looks like this. It's fantastic. Um, it's a beautiful meadow. This is looking down the site, the stream. There's a stream just in the woods. And then for eight months, it's that. <laughs> so we, we were the only ones in the competition. You know, I think it had IMP and it's Kyle Trav and everybody, and everybody was referring to this all the time. And we just continually referred to this and said, that's what most Moscovites deal with. And if you're going to be in this landscape, this is where you're going to be. Um, so in a way, when you look at that building, you're really looking at a snow building. It's a really a, a response to this harsh snow climate and a way of planning architecture so that it removes itself from the sort of, um, sort of classical planning of a, of a sort of master plan grid, but ones that kind of makes up a kind of hyper dense building, uh, a vertical plan, um, a sort of overlapping uh, plan. Um, so we we kind of said you had to, you know, all the key critical functions of of the um, plan had to be not in the sort of traditional format of a quad of any sort, but really had to become one form and um, really become an overlap. This is sort of if these are plans, this is section, and this is back to plan again. So you have basically um, this idea of a kind of infrastructure that supports the four colors um, which sit on top, and then that becomes the concentration. This is a 300 meter disc um, with um, a sort of hotel, uh, administration building, a pleasure building, and a, and a student hostel for 300 students, 250 students. Plan-wise, um, it, it sort of looks a bit, this is the figure of the form, the topology and the plate. These are sort of typical three-bedroom houses here, which is these dash and cottages for, that we planned for the staff who didn't want to live in the building. So they wanted, we, we insisted that we wanted to put them on the podium. They insisted that they needed to have their own um, little forest getaway. So, so they're the only ones who get these timber cottages, but we made them look back at the building. But anyway, that's the, the, the form of the building. It's, um, uh, I'll quickly go through it. It's the ground plane of that large disk allows the gathering and the servicing of the project to work. You have parking, immediate parking, and you have basically student, uh, you have basically these three reception areas. So you can go round and round as a kind of, it's a big roundabout. You can loop in, go in, or go round to VIP, or go down to conferencing. The way the school works is that they worked out that they could um, overlap conference, a conference facility, a 3,000 seat, a 3,500 seat, a conference facility for elite, you know, for the Moscow business world um, to hire out and to have a five star hotel also um, take a space in the building so that there's this revenue that's made for the school by this conferencing facility. But the revenue makes sense because it's not just driven by economics, it's driven by a desire to bring the business world directly to the school. So what you're looking at is is a strategy to kind of set up the economic strategy for the school, and then obviously the school has its own revenue. Um, the plan in the disc above that one that I showed is this, where you have these petal-like forms, and there's a reason for it, I'll come to it in a second, which are basically the schools. Each uh, school is differentiated by these forms, and then they share a common infrastructure in the center. The school has a 500-seat auditorium here, and then the 3,000-seat uh, uh, sort of auditoriums over here. Hotel is in this bar. These cores are the sort of main infrastructure that sort of dive down the building and then go up. And then sort of above that, this is a sort of nine meter plate, is the five um, 
five-star hotel, the student block here, a pleasure building, which is a spa, gym, uh, etc. building, a library and administration building here. This is north, these point east, this is west, and this is the southern bar. So in a way, the building is also, in a way, presenting this idea of the orientation that it's specifically in. And then this was really a strategy. If I can move it on without it. Sorry, it's quite a, I think it always does this. Now it's gonna go up three. <laughs> okay, maybe four. It seems to be stuck. Ah, there you go. Yeah, three or four, of course. <laughs> well, whilst it's going backwards, <laughs> that's the diagram that I was I think, does this battery run out or something? Okay, I can do it on that. That's, this is, this is really that plan of the, the plates where you see the kind of the life, the communal life of the school, where, um, sorry, the, um, this thing is not working anymore. It's a shame. Is there another pointer maybe? So I could just, otherwise I can't point to anything, but it's, I guess, quite clear. Um, I think the battery just died. But anyway, you basically get the solar diagram. It's, it's, it's really a... Thanks. Sorry, <laughs> did it just die? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, where is it? I can just use that, can't I? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, great. So um, this is north. So the conference center and exhibition center is north. Then the school um, really sort of rings around that sort of in the west. And what you do is that you have introverted school rooms and then breakout spaces next to each one. And each one, in a way, maps the, the light from morning to evening. So you have sort of moment, then shaft of light. And what you get is that you watch the day, how the light really kind of moves around this, this, this building. So this is the building. Um, in its real context, this is the sort of scenario. So you come um, off the main highway, you move um, to the west, you see the sort of pleasure building, then you drive underneath it um, for all the sort of immediate students and staff underneath, and then when there's conferencing, there's a sort of parking off the side. And then you rise up into the main disc, and the main disc is then the teaching and conferencing areas. This is uh, a sort of landscape on the roof for then the hotel, the student block, and the wellness center in the summer months. It becomes a Belvedere to the landscape. This is looking away to, from Moscow, and then Moscow is that way. Um, and then from the school, you're able to come down or go up. This is looking from the east. So you're looking at, this is the student block, this is the hotel, and yeah, Moscow is that way. And then this is from the cemetery back. Um, so you're seeing how the building sort of works within its, its uh, context. And then for those two to three months, it's like this. And you're looking from its uh, northern aspect, sort of the north bar, sort of looking at you. Um, in a way, because what's really funny, when, as soon as we finish, there's a whole ton, there's a whole community that's being built all around this now. So this was a moment a transition moment. So in a way, there's something about this very generic, I was very interested in this, a non-expression of the volumes up above, but just to really express their, topologi their typologic kind of quality very abstractly, but not to kind of give it a figure which would then place it within a specific sort of past history of you know, um, what these kind of topologies could mean. Because I was basically referring to the volumetric scale, scale uh, dimensions of the history of Moscow, the 20th century sort of history, really. Um, so everything from the Brezhnev sort of super cantilever buildings through to the sort of more volumetric um, sort of cathedral architecture. And then as you come round, um, you start to see the form, but you see how the window's articulated. Um, you have basically uh, this, uh, four stories. You can see probably the best is uh, where you see the window articulation. 
It's all glass tiles, it's one material, and it's just different um, reflective materials on the backs of the glass tessellating to make that form. So in a way, it's also maybe like a drawing of the light, in a way. So this is that southern bar, which is the student block um, for the cantilevers. These are 130-foot cantilevers off. And the building comes down on two cores. It's a concrete frame building. It's a totally moment uh, structure. And you know, um, it's very difficult to get Western engineers to do this. In the end, we had to use um, some guys who were in that Brezhnev area who made those super concrete ruthless buildings who were able to do this very easily without massive trussing everywhere. It was actually hilarious. They uh, actually laughed at the amount of steel that we had in the, I will say, Western engineers model, um, which made the project four times over, but you know, it was, it was actually, it almost broke the project. We couldn't build it because it was, to kind of achieve the cantilevers, we were just going too far. And these uh, Soviet engineers just said, no, we can do this in moment structures. So you can do it in concrete. And we're like, concrete at minus 30, how'd you do that? They cast this, um, it was kind of incredible. And you know, it's a classic 1930s moment where the props move away from here and everybody you know, like, is like, is it gonna tip over? Um, you know, in Russia, they're like, no, it's, nobody knows how to build. They, these are amazing engineers and they built it with an incredible means, economic means. So that was, very interesting to see how using the local knowledge also can be very powerful sometimes and not always relying on your usual conventions. So this is sort of the ramps that take you from the school buildings and uh, this is looking the southern block towards the west and sort of from that conference center. This is if you drove in in the winter underneath the building. Um, some of the, one of the lobbies, this is the sort of uh, conferencing lobby that you come up into register cloakrooms and then escalators up to um, uh, it's the main auditorium with um, it's sort of the sort of main sort of uh, auditorium with the sort of one of the sort of major skylights. The way we got got over the 350 meter um, sort of disc with the sort of deep plan was to plant these very large light wells, which you'll see throughout the entire thing. But you can see. Um, the sort of quality of light that you get on the perimeter of the building. And then this is really deep inside the plan. This is done by the school. We didn't design these blue things, but we designed all the forms and they sort of color coded all this. Um, we designed the infrastructure of the ceiling and the floor and the forms, and they've sort of decorated it, um, which is a new experience for us. It was the first time we'd had to do that. <laughs> but they were not too bad. They were trying to somehow copy something they thought we would like, <laughs> but they wouldn't give us the... Uh, <laughs> the contract. <laughs> so anyway, this is a very interesting moment. Um, so we, you know, what, you, what was interesting is we were able to develop these very luminous large skylights which completely bathed, by using a white marble floor, completely bathed the space in that kind of luminosity. And with the circular plan, what was interesting is you had this kind of circuit idea which started to happen where you, this is the central area and you'd move through that, but you would have this very interesting idea of circuit. You'd, there is never in the plan a dead end. There's never in a kind of an orthogonal grid the idea that you get to a beginning or an end. You're always in this loop, um, and in a way, it almost acts like a quad without a garden. It was a fascinating sort of realization of having the plan and kind of walking it. Um, and then what you have is the schools um, and their breakout areas and the views and the light that comes through them, and then you know the hermetic interiors with the lights and the ability to close them off. Um, and then just looking from the west, just seeing how the disc really becomes a datum and sort of operates and sort of north becomes this kind of pointer. And you can see this is a recent photo. Look at the sort of buildings that have started. This has now been designated as a sort of um, a, um, Russia's Silicon Valley. So, you know, this is where all the kind of startups and all the tech guys are all coming and it's becoming this new area. The, this building, has a pool, an Olympic pool, which we, you know, after discussing with the school, realized that there are a lot of very incredible swimmers in Russia, but also there's an Olympic swimming team very close by. So we built an Olympic pool for both students, but also now the free diving, what are the, you know, what is that dancing diving thing? I'm really crap at it. <laughs> Synchronized swimming. <laughs> Synchronized swimmers use this twice a week. They rent it. They use this. So there's this kind of moment that always occurs where you know, people bring their friends to watch the synchronized swimmers 
you know, you just just practicing in this pool every week. Um, so you have conferencing, you have these incredible athletes, and these you know new business management guys, you know, running around networking and sort of yeah, which was the whole thing. And then above it, you have courts. So this is really the kind of the body hall. This is the golden building, which this sort of very constructivist reference, of, you know, sort of slightly Popova-like um, characters. And then, you know, just coming out of that, seeing the student block. Um, no, this is the hotel, sorry, the north block, and then school. This is between those again. This has become a landscape now. The south, really seeing the cantilever. So you see how the building is held on these two cores, which go down. And the entire thing is really this cantilever. There are no braces. It's a complete grid moment frame, um, which I just couldn't believe, how, you know. We, we were quite shocked. So, um, and you can see the new buildings which are now coming around the whole thing. And then this is the little cottages we designed <laughs> for fun <laughs> to look back as a little joke. So even though they're away, they have to all look back at the building. Anyway, it's a little silly joke. And then the northern building, um, a view of the interior. We didn't choose the chairs. The, ch the chairman was really proud to send us his photo of his office, sort of thinking about the architecture but you can get a sense of the windows. <laughs> um, and then this is the southern, uh, the eastern aspect, and sort of views from the room, and then in the evening. Um, I also want to talk to you about a project now that we're doing on the Washington Mall that okay, sort of referred to. Um, this will be the sort of last of the large scale projects, and then I'll talk about two smaller projects, and then I think that'll be it. Um, Smithsonian, as you all know, this, I don't need to kind of explain. Um, <laughs> it's nice not to have to explain. Um, usually when I'm lecturing elsewhere, they're like, where is it, what is it? So, but in case you don't know where it is, that's the site. So oh, this is um, Constitution Ave, that's the White House. You understand, I don't know if you guys know, but the monumental core really is the most extraordinary piece of theater. It's almost a kind of Schinkel-esque landscape for the foreign office windows, which are just here. I finally understood it when I was kind of in this place, to, that this set piece really is the masterpiece of diplomacy of American sort of civic, the civic, civic theater. It's beautiful. Um, you have Jefferson beautifully framed, and it's all about talking about how you can make the world. Anyway, when you're in it, um, this is the kind of, uh, the walking park, that's the more proper. And we're really on this threshold knuckle, the junction. Something that we pointed out very quickly is that apart from the building being, you know, the content holder of the museum, that it was also a, a kind of panoptic moment in the city, um, not in terms of a vertical overview, but in terms of a kind of a pinwheel of certain critical monuments. So from Congress to Jefferson to Martin Luther King, the reflecting pool, um, Lincoln, the White House, and the National Archive, and obviously the Mall, and that we wanted to kind of use that as an articulating device within the building. So apart from the kind of program of the building, there's this idea that the building also absorbs as a kind of way to understand the sort of monumental core of Washington. Um, I and Pay's here, it's triangles, Bunshaft Circle is here, and my square is here. And then in a way you understand how the building coordinates. So in a way, these are the windows that are in, there are only this many windows in the building, and then there's really a screen. Um, Catherine Gustafsson is working with us on the landscaping, and she's had a really difficult time working with the Beaux-Arts plan and all the kind of conflicting data about keeping this Beaux-Arts plan, um, but she's done an amazing job of kind of helping us articulate a southern climatic sort of entrance, it's a south-facing, and a northern sort of tranquil space which can relate to the Washington yeah. Memorial Grounds and then still keep the bazaar interlocking ellipses that can allow people to come from the subway and still, you know, we had huge arguments about being able to see the monument from here and from here and from here and from here. So, you know, it's, it's been a very interesting few years, but it's, I think, produced a strong building. We've got the building that we really wanted and um, I'm really very excited to show you where we are. Let me see if this will move forward. Okay. Maybe some references that you may have heard about. Okay. Um, the corona is really from 
this image. This is Olu, a very important sculptor from um, the Yoruba period. So this is back to West Africa. This is the shrine houses, the most inner court. This is Olu's articulation of the porch. This is terrace moments with courtyards. And the story of the kings are carved like karyatids, of course. And the karyatids of the kings and their stories are here. And each one has this corona. So in a way, that's the reference that was very powerful and important to me. And I, I was drawn to it when we were working because in a way it makes a very strong relationship to the Washington Monument. And there was something very interesting about this idea between the monuments, uh, the sort of this, the founding fathers of America sort of chose two polemics between the pharaonic and the Greek, the Greek um, both neo, but this between the pharaonic and the Greek, these two strategies that sort of articulate the monumental core. So in a way, the whole classical tradition is encompassed somehow if, if you understand it or don't. And there was something very interesting about seeing uh, uh, the Yoruba, who also relate very much to the pharaonic in their terms of that trajectory, um, bring the pyramid form into this thing. And I thought that that was fascinating. And that the classic images you have of southern um, sort of African-Americans on the porch and this imagery are not disconnected. The agrarian landscape of the south the urban landscape of Louisiana and Charleston. And this, this architecture, which we know so well and take for granted, but actually which was really something that was really initially um, brought into being by slaves, really. This ironwork architecture was really made by African Americans. They, you know, that move from the um, agrarian landscape to the first professional guilds was carpenters and ironsmiths. Um, so this is a really important sort of articulating uh, moment for me in when you look at the history of um, the African American um, uh, people and how they've sort of shifted from that that world in the south to the north and and the sort of moving through the sort of uh, different parts of uh, American life. I thought that this was a very powerful moment, and so I became very inspired by taking on this um, idea of casting. So we, you know, with that triple triple tier karyatid and um, and this idea of casting, sort of about making this pavilion building that sat on this plinth, which was the landscape, um, and articulated a lower world and an upper world. I'll just quickly go through the plans, not in any detail, but this is the lower plan where you come in. We take It's a five-acre site, and we take the entire site. So what you see above is just 50% of the building. Um, back of house is all this, there's loading bays, etc. Front of house on the northern side is the most important galleries, which was sort of place where the, the old canal, working canals used to be, which is the history galleries. And I have a couple of images to show you from that. We've been working with um, Ralph Applebaum's um, office who are doing the exhibition uh, uh, spaces for the interior who've kind of working with us have um, developed an extraordinary history gallery and exhibition spaces that we're really excited about. Um, anyway, we managed to develop a very powerful section um, that will be the history gallery, which is the most permanent galleries, and then sort of auditorium, etc. cetera. Um, main plan, which is the south, the, the buildings are 210 by 210 cube with a secondary cube in it shifted off axes. Um, all the circulation happens on the north and the west. And then there's this kind of um, atrium that wraps around it, which makes a sort of climate moderate, it makes, it's the climate moderator, really. The content and the, the sort of jewels are in the box here and below ground. Um, and then the skin is around it. The building is held on four cores and cantilevered absolutely around. Everything is in those four cores and then everything else is articulated as a series of pavilions that you move through. Loading is on the 14th, um, 15th in the west. As you go up the plans, there's a kind of fantastic porch moment. I just, just go through this, you don't need to see this sort of infrastructure. You're getting to see the details of this building, but these are the, the plans. Um, exhibition level number one, uh, exhibition level number two, and the roof with the admin, uh, sort of the administration above it. Um, so you get the sense of the scale. That's the monument there. Um, that's the building underground and the building above ground, the skin. You can see the scale of it. It's very much a kind of Washington scale building. This is the federal triangle behind, so it's in scale with the federal triangle. Um, you can see the proximity to the monument. 
and you can see this form. The, the pyramid at the top is what I was kind of referring to in terms of the pharaonic. I mean, the needle is, a, um, it's from, you know, Karnak. It's one of Karnak's needles scaled up. Um, but that angle is what generates the angle of the corona. So in a way, there's a kind of relationship. The inverted triple pyramid referring to the sort of pyramid on the plinth. The form of the building is that you have this transparent center, content below, content above, and that this center is a kind of dissolved ground plane which connects the north and south and becomes a public room for Washington. So cross-section wise, this is the south, this is a federal triangle here, this is the public room which you pass through, the building, um, auditorium in the heart, exhibition, the main history galleries are here, this is a 50-foot space um, which sort of contains that on this triple tier with a kind of reflecting moment here and then you have other exhibition spaces, research, bedded between the two, and then administration. The building is in this double skin for a reason. Um, I'll show you why. Essentially, we've also been working with Guy Nordstein's office to um, really see um, how, I mean, Guy's team's been amazing. They've developed this extraordinary net structure for us, which allows us to kind of deal with the absorption of um, a security blast, which is one of the kind of overriding criteria of a building on the mall. Um, so this idea of a building within a building, this really the real building, and the skin, which is the sort of the, the sort of dress around it, um, becomes a system that deals with the blast, um, which allows the content and this building to be unaffected. So you have this kind of moment where you have this articulated sort of mute form that then pokes with its eyes these windows to the sort of skirt. Um, this is Guy's diagram, but I love showing it. But he essentially developed a series of trusses and cables which suspend the entire structure. Um, so the entire thing is a kind of moving skirt. It literally, the model that they showed us was extraordinary. It just buckles and twists. So you can get a tack on it and it deflects and absorbs the energy around the whole thing. So I think this is the first time it's been done in a full, sort of full freestanding building. So it'd be I think a very amazing thing to see. It's been tried in atriums, but not as a kind of skin for a building. And then you have the skin, which is this panel system. I'll just talk to you a little bit about it. It's a, it's a cast concrete um, mat, uh, with a bronze coating on it. It's a very perverse hybrid material. <laughs> but basically, you think it's metal, it's actually concrete. But it looks like metal. And the front looks like concrete, but it's actually metal, and it'll look like stone. And, and it's to do with the hybridity of materials right now, in a way. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, so that's really giving you a one-to-one -one detail, and you can see somebody's hand there, so you can see the scale of it. So the skin is, is this poured bronze onto this uh, exo-frame. So that's the building from the south. Um, you can see this idea of this triple corona and then this cut plane, ground plane, which becomes completely this transparent ground plane which connects north, south, east, west, held on, on these perimeter columns. This is the 200, 200 foot sort of um, aperture. And as you come to the entrance, because this is south, you have this uh, just under 50 foot canopy which makes this microclimate with this reflecting sheet, reflecting pool, so that we're cooling you down here before you get into the building. And then the sort of room, the sort of Washington room, the public room, before you get into the museum, which is the sort of gathering space for the city, um, allows for media um, circulation on the west here. Under this um, large um, timber uh, sort of stalactite ceiling, so like, we'll call it, it's a kind of inverted forest of content above you, content below you. In a way, for me, this moment where you've become a karyatid in the building, this is for me, the content touching you, connecting you to the ground, and you to it above. This idea of trying to then make a kind of vast hall with a singular image rather than a sort of servicing image. Um, sort of the perimeter, which is where the circulation is, the, the incredible porch and the views that you'll get to the landscape. Early ideas about exhibition content, this has all been superseded. Um, the circulation void, this is a moment where you're actually in the lower levels looking towards the sort of triple height space which will be here, looking right up the corona. Sort of some of the lower level spaces, some of the exhibition spaces. 
And then the history galleries, this is um, um, a Ralph Alcabarn's imagery, but this idea of this approach to this extraordinary space that they're creating where you have this 50-foot um, wall um, um, and then this incredible procession that takes you through the content and then brings you to this volume, which is this memorial chamber, which then you can't see it, but the, the monument is just here. Um, and then the south that you've come on, so sort of descending back into the city. And then I'll just do quick two small projects. I don't know, I'm probably kind of killing you, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, very quickly, two houses. It's just to give you different scales. This is Park um, for New York, and this is 77th. This is a house we took us about four years. It took us two years to get it through landmarks, and it took four years to build for a collector. Um, very interesting collector in New York, where we completely got one of these carriage houses, which are listed uh, in the historic set of belt, and we completely built a new 10,000 square foot house behind. I'll just go through it. It's very close to the Whitney, as you know, so there's a kind of game with Marcel Breuer and the New York grid and the verticality of New York. But the plans are very, again, really very direct. I'll just, there's some silly things that happen. One, you go through a bridge from the entrance, that's the street, that's the carriage facade, you go through a bridge into a gallery as the first room, almost Venetian in a way, almost like a court, an ante room, and then you slip through the most tiny stair up, oh, the plans are, that's the basement level, sorry, so down that stair to the lower level, which is a series of suites and rooms, that's the court, and up that staircase I talked to into the sort of Piano Nobile where you have the family room, the living room, sort of a picture room, and then a library, and this is the kind of fragment of the, um, the uh, carriage house which is left. And basically, the whole building is basically two structural walls which go right down a couple of floors, you'll see in the section, to the ground, and then a series of spanning beams that just run across, and the beams are perforated to make windows for the rooms, etc., or to kind of enclose spaces. And you have a series of th towers, in a way, three towers which rise up, ending in the sort of you know, the master bedroom over the top. So that's the section. This is the ground plane. So it's an extraordinary excavation where you see in parts, this is New York schist. So it's a kind of vertical archeology span of the city, but also a kind of acknowledgement of the grid of the city. So you have these cuts where you have the fragment of the city on its street, the main rooms of the building, the family rooms of the house, and, and then the, the courts, the, the light wells at the rear, and then the servicing at the back. So this is just kind of almost re miniaturizing the city to use as a kind of way of making uh, a house uh, for this uh, sort of incredible collector. So from, these are really the elevations, this kind of hybridity, this welding between these two worlds, the house built behind, the house in front, um, the well, the bridge, and the courts. And then really, this, this is from a neighbor who let us see it. Um, <laughs> that's the house, and it's made out of raw concrete we try to get basically as unfinished concrete as possible, which we paid a lot of money for, which was very strange. Nobody knows how to do, everybody's, tra Ando's trained the world to do very good concrete, and now nobody knows how to do rough concrete anymore. So you have to untrain people to do rough concrete. Because they're trying to always make it nice and smooth for you, so I urge you to choose rough concrete so we can have a balance. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see if I can move this thing as slow. That's the entry through the gate. The first court, um, this is the fragment of the, the carriage house. And then as you go through, you can see the way the concrete has been cast against that building. So you're seeing the front and back. And there's a kind of cast wall against the um, facade, which is this sort of fragment. And then you sort of walk into the house. This is that gallery room. This is developed so you can drive a truck, small truck, mini truck, straight in. The gallery space with, you know, Pierre Palin and, you know, uh, I don't need to go through the art stuff. And then the staircase, which is just behind. The sort of narrow stair, which compresses you along the party wall and brings you up into the living room. And then at the living room, you see the second stair, which takes you to the upper courts, but the central second light well, which is the one that distinguishes the family and then the public parts. The main wall between the two, this is the moment where you cross to the fragment of the carriage house, the, the real facade of the house here, um, and then 
this window which overlooks a Maurizio Catalan installation that was placed in. And then this is that moment when you're in the existing building looking back at the new building and through. Um, so this is the sort of grand salon, sort of hanging room. And sort of looking back at that. Um, so this person collects furniture. These are Pierre Paulin specifically commissioned, you know, Ralph Fire. This is um, Roman. This is one of Damien Hirst's sort of cancer paintings, extraordinary painting, and obviously the amazing Basquiat devil painting that this man owns. Um, looking back, so that's the staircase you came up. That's the other staircase that brings you up. Looking into that corner, terrace, the, the third light well, and that's the only window on park. So we can have one elevation to park, that's it. <laughs> um, so you can see the beams. These are really beam walls to the, to the edge walls, and then this is the sort of courtyard on the upper level and the cutouts that we made across those beams and then the sort of building, the last court, the last tower in the context of the city. And then sort of each floor, because it becomes so small, is a kind of program of one function um, as you go up. And then the bedroom has this mask, um, which is the upper level. And then as you go down, we excavated and exposed and reinforced the schist. This is the New York schist, the old foundation stones of New York. So this is the old walls to where we braced around it to sort of have it come inside the house as well. So you have schists kind of merging inside and outside the house. This is a lower basement into sort of the sort of suites and rooms that for guests. And then the front court where the Maurizio Catalan is as you rise up um, in the sort of rough aggregate court. And there's that Maurizio Catalan, which is a really poignant piece of work because it talks about the decline of the financial market actually. And I think Mauricio did it not realizing that he was really being this prophet. <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a very interesting piece of work. Um, yeah, the death of Pinocchio, the death of the, of the, uh, <laughs> of all that uh, funny magic. Anyway, lastly, and I'll leave you with, because we still work very much with artists. Um, this is a work that we did in Berlin that even half my studio don't realize. Now that we have different studios, half the offices don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I'm the connector across the whole thing, so I'm always going around, but anyway. Um, Berlin, where I have a small studio and we work, we did a very beautiful installation for a very beautiful work by Tim Noble and Sue Webster in the old De Spiegel um, print work factory. And it's basically um, Tim and Sue, who I built the dirty house for, one of the first houses I did. Um, uh, this was their big show in Berlin and they wanted to make an installation and they wanted me to work with them on it specifically and they talked about, we were always talking about this idea of returning back to Africa but really they had just visited um, K27 in Luxor, the, the, the pyramid um, and really the, this, this is the burial chamber of the kings and um, I sort of said always it's one of like one of my favorite sort of tyranny architectural spaces where there's nothing but everything happens in your mind. Um, until you get to the chamber and you light the torch and you can't believe what you see. So um, the work is called Seven Corners. It's an in, in the De Spiegel factory, as I said, which is this is old factory which they've decamped out of because print, print media has changed. This is where the print spools were, and we've converted this into a gallery for Blaine Sutherland. But for the first show, we bust through into the next door building, which is very bizarre. So you have all this, and we, said, <laughs> we sort of arrived and said, how about the building next door? bust through into that and place that installation that you saw, which is basically black formaldehyde, uh, MDF, untreated, but um, structured to basically make seven lights and seven tunnels, um, seven shafts that you go through, which then gets you to the, to the treasure. So one, two, three, four, Seven. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> that was a double shot in there. And then you come into the room, and this is a sort of typical Tim and Sue you think, which is a portrait of them. But as you come into the room, you realize the room is a compressed, crumpled, crushed sort of pyramid. Um, and the work is these two gold, two gold pieces, which are basically made from petrified rats. And 
that's the end of the lecture. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Vaan, a student. Uh, David, uh, I saw in your projects how you're using the light, this beautiful atmospheric effect. Like, I was wondering how you achieved how you achieved that. I assume you can rely only on CGI to to make assumptions how your buildings will look like after they're built. Oh, oh how do I know what the yeah, atmosphere is? <laughs> how do you know how 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 do you create that as atmosphere? <laughs> I, I wish somebody, you know, if I could pull that out of my head, I don't know, I, um, I make models. I don't really, the CGI's are not how I test it, but we do use a lot of lighting diagrams now, uh, lighting programs, so we, we look at things. But I'm, I mean, underscoring all the work is a kind of a lot of research in the beginning um, of my career that just really, that from the first houses, were really experiments in how, studying how mass and light and form work. So there were studies about how light comes from above. You know, the first house, Electro House, was all a study about not using light from the vertical elevation, but only from the sort of flat elevation. So it's a house which works with these light wells, you know, and the dirty house worked with these kind of drop shafts. So in a way, I've been testing models of light through different topologies, and I, it's got to the point where it's now no, not so didactic, it's much more active, maybe. Okay, thanks. I have a second question, if you, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, and you, you're looking uh, like on culture, on like trying to find your concepts from, uh, from different cultures and stuff. Uh, how do you look on the idea of uh, bringing the uh, general public as a critic to your projects, like in Washington's case? Yeah, I how, mean, how interested are you in uh, opinion? Very. I, I think that there's no um, there's no conflict with a with a dialogue with the public, whatever that is. It's not about um, doing what you think the public wants you to do. It's about understanding the concerns that are in that public realm. But as an architect, you are responsible not just for just listening to one the client brief, uh, to public perception, but also to a history of building which is thousands of years old. Uh, and to cultures and civilizations and to unheard voices. In a way, if every architect is really building on the sort of shoulders of the architects before them, I, I kind of think that you always work very holistically and that you can't just sort of, you can't narrow it down. You can't narrow utility down to one thing. You know, you, you can't be so precise. You, you have to be, I mean, that's why we're architects. We measure the response within a kind of wide context of time. I mean, time being the kind of, the issue, you know, we you should be able to slow down time, time meaning history, and also present time meaning, you know, and then also look forward. Thanks. Um, looking at your projects on Africa, yeah, um, in particular, uh, you had mentioned that your project is not specifically on the city. Um, <laughs> but, but those images were all city right, groupings. Right. No, not, As I not, not in particular, just um, mm -hmm. considering, I guess, the population boom that's occurring in many African cities, mm -hmm. what are the political implications of, of your projects, I would say? Um, there is a massive um, urbanization that's occurring. Maybe that's, I mean, there, the population boom is big, but it's not so dramatic. I mean, it's, there are hot spots, but there's the bigger problem is actually the big shift that's happening from the countryside to the city. Um, and that's actually what's fueling the explosion of city life. Um, I, you know, the reason why I showed you what I was trying to do is that I think that you can start to think about architecture in terms, yeah, I think about architecture in terms of topology. And I don't mean that in an old, I don't mean it in a Rossian sense, but I use the Rossian idea 
and move forward from that. I'm not talking about style, I'm actually almost talking a kind of an abstracted idea of topological profile. So in a way, I very specifically am very interested in the analysis of the different responses that you make as topology within different terrains. And then how those terrains um, enforce and kind of then allow a kind of um, a development of certain kind of nuances and styles that occur. And, and whether that is something that you can track. And the, the, the photo documentary of the books, if you look through them, I be, I've just given you summarizing overviews, which are not really my imagery. Um, it's really several sort of imagery of satellite data to summarize. But if you look through the book there, I've got, you will realize very quickly that you're looking at domestic topologies, residential topology, low and high, um, medium, you're looking at civic topology, low, high, medium, you're looking at bucolic aspects, low, high, inform, you know, from the government center right through to the guy, the place where the, you know, the guys, you know, are, it's a dumping ground, but actually it's a place where the guys hang out. You know, you're looking at all the landscapes as topological types. And in a way, I'm sort of trying to say that the architect, we have become slightly obsessed with urban plan, but I don't know if anybody really knows what's really going on there. <laughs> and I, don't, I say that very provocatively. I mean, in a sense that the architects are, for architects, our control is really in the kind of topology and the nature of the profile of the city. So I kind of think that I wanna, I'm interested in pushing the discussion to go back to what is, what is the architecture rather than what is the sort of sociological plan or the impact, the economic plan you know, in a way, we need other experts to work with us when we're doing that, but what we're damn good at knowing is what is the morphology of the, of the, type, of the type, you know, and how does it grow, and, and how do we add to it, how do we go against it, how do we radicalize it, how do we grow it a different way? In reference to that, I was just thinking that maybe you <clears throat> could, could mention or, or compare with your analysis of Africa to that beautiful drawing you did of, of, um, of Europe. Um, maybe the some people are not f familiar with that, but were you, yeah. Yeah, and in a way, I mean, this is something Jorge saw that we were in a conference uh, talking about, but I, I did a study of Europe where I said, um, conversely, you could study Europe through its infrastructure diagrams rather than its picturesque imagery, which everybody's obsessed with. And that if you, if you wanted to understand the cities, you could understand them by looking at abstracting the infrastructure networks and then making a proposition about new kinds of ways of making um, densities or agglomerations by actually overlapping and weaving the infrastructure networks. So you've got this mats of 27, 33 cities woven by infrastructure to make massive networks or smaller networks. And then in a way, Typologically, what you're doing is eros eroding or adding, subtracting within that, and understanding new forms that come from it. Almost like, you know, and it, rather than sort of this idea of a kind of grid where you, you change or you, you know, the idea of the urban plan, which is that you wipe and then you just draw a new pattern, and then you hope the pattern means something in your mind about some idea to do with democracy, and then yeah. I'm being simplistic to make the point, but it's a little. I'm sort of like, I want a different voice. Could you wait for the mic? Sorry, so everyone can hear you. Okay. We'll take one more question after this. And then... Can you talk about uh, pattern making with um, the Russia project and yeah. in comparison to the museum in DC? Um, well, I mean, I think that I wouldn't call it pattern making, but I would call it, um, it's actually really about fabrication. It's probably, the, it's probably the, the closest thing to some idea about fabrication, which is about processes now um, that my practice gets to. <laughs> you know, it's a kind of, it's really about how you, um, the idea of the component. Um, but in a way, in, in Russia, as I said, the kind of the driving force was, the driving force across all the projects, as I said, you know, confession is light. So in Russia, it's a drawing about light, qualities, colors of light, very directly, almost like childlike colors of light. You know, warm, West, warm Western uh, 
sunset colors versus very kind of crisp early morning light versus very kind of neutral grays of the north, simplistically. But literally, when you upscale it at a, that size, it does something very interesting. When you start to show the color in the direction, in the atmosphere, it does something. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting for people to see because actually when you suddenly go, you know, you put the oranges in the west and you put the blues in the north, visually something starts to happen. And with Washington, in a way, the body of the, it's the moment where you, ha you have this, um, it's the kind of turn point, but it's also a building which is also about filtering light. So between the outer skin and the real body of the building, as I'm calling it, you get all this um, moderate, mod modulating of light. So the west light, which is where all the circulation occurs and the, all the activity, and it's so difficult to describe that to a client, we're saying that the west was really important. They understood it just about view, but for me it was about the way in which the light would always draw you to that. So when you enter the building, the westerly aspect would pull you in a way that you could never make in plan form. Um, that's going to happen. And then the way in which we lace that, that is really important. And then the way in which after you've done that, we want to move you to the north because we want to move you to then focus into the galleries very specifically. But that actually entirely around the entire thing is this bathing of east, west, south, and north light. So by actually not making an atrium in the center, but by making a kind of a system which actually allows you to see, sight on all four, see light on four sides, not only are you looking at the light on the outside, but you're experiencing the, the filtering of the light on the inside. Um, oh, I'm wondering um, how you, in, in particular with the Africa projects, mm. um, how you're contending with history. Because I'm thinking about, in particular, mm. the way that you presented the projects had a very similar kind of uh, presentation. A lot with kind of the climate and the geography, right? And in the kind of in the early post-war and early post-colonial period, the mm. development of climatic design, mm. or sorry, yeah, climatic design was precisely a way to design for places like Africa. Mm -hmm. um, at a period, especially I'm thinking in Britain, at a period when there was a kind of rise of historicism. Yep. Um, and because Africa at the time was thought to not have a history to have to contend with, you could design in this kind of super technocratic way that didn't have to respond to a type of history. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering now, you know, 60, 50, 40, 50, 60 years later, um, when you're taking very similar kind of techniques um, and even forms and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how now that, that there is, you know, you can't kind of make the same claims about the history. Um, I'm wondering how that feeds into the design process. Um, I mean, Jane Drew and sort of the gang that were sort of experimenting with that idea of a kind of universal very quickly realized when they landed that that, ab that abstract idea was slightly defunct. That actually there was, um, even though the colonial period had completely erased that discourse of a, a specific way of living, that they had to suddenly start contending with it. Um, so they built this architecture and realized very quickly that it failed in most places, and then they had to kind of adjust. Um, but what they learned very quickly, and when you go from Congo right through to West Africa, is that you realize that there are these nuanced responses to the very same idea. It could no longer be universal and dropped in. And that this idea that you could make a kind of technocratic machine which, which could just plug straight into Africa sort of failed. When I'm sort of looking at that, that failure is not a problem for me, it, but it's a kind of almost first generation test. But it doesn't mean that you abandon the sort of the inherent thinking that was behind it either, but it, it means that you don't apply it exactly as it was. What I'm trying to show you is that I think that there's a way by you can um, expand the, the, the repertoire of response climatically so that it's no longer generic. In a sense, it's, oh, it's really hot, so you put louvers in. It's uh, really you know, bright, so you make big windows. Or you know, it's really efficient, so you make a corridor. If you notice, the, the study was trying to say that actually there is a kind of topology of responses in those climates as well, which needs to be unpacked and to be understood specifically so that you can start to kind of talk about, even before you sort of um, make that basic response, there is a kind of a very clear environmental strategy that you have to be working within. And then from there, if your architecture gets more sophisticated, you can actually then nuance it by patterns of the settlements if you understand what those city conditions are. So in a way, there's a kind of, it's, it's really, for me, this idea of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not very interested in my work in this sort of throwaway, let's try another sketch, wrap, you know, 
it's kind of very additive, but it kind of expands from things that, are, that have gone before, but it becomes more precise in the way it starts to re-engage again. So the, the, the conversation, if you see, is that, um, I mean, like with the Almina project, you've never seen an infrastructure project like that to deal with climate. There isn't one on the continent. They thought about it, but nobody's ever, there may have been sketches, but there's never been one done. And the reason for me for doing it is not to say, oh, you know, those are great heroic um, infrastructure projects, but it's to say that actually, if you look at the kind of way in which the climate can work, there is maybe something that you can learn from it. When you look at the forest's canopy and the scale of the forest canopy, that for me is a direct response to place when, the, when, when that sort of landscape is, is, is so profound. It's, it's this idea that you have a kind of first, and that maybe that is the first architecture, and then inhabitation happens at a sort of smaller level. And in a way that you can, you can start to talk for me that that is a kind of almost touching to a vernacular, but then also using a kind of super, super science, as it were, to sort of play between both. So you're actually starting to kind of bridge, you, know, you look more precisely and you engage more precisely. You still use the science, but then you start by doing that to start to hit something more precisely. And then I think you can then nuance it with more as you gather more information. Can you take one more? Yeah. Um, Where is it? I saw up here. Oh, also. there's one. Okay. Good. Did you want to? So you point. Yeah. So um, the first book uh, about the houses was very kind of straightforward about the architectural strategy and like you know it was a series of studies on light and a series of studies on uh, the different spatial demographics that you were dealing with, but the second book starts to delve into kind of uh, some of the stuff that's, that uh, the work seems to be heading towards now, which is studying these Ar African uh, artifacts and uh, African patterns. And I'm just wondering, like, uh, especially when you're uh, working with those patterns and those inspirations in the Western context, how do you avoid kind of... Uh, ex Disney. <laughs> ...exoticizing, uh, you know, those unheard voices that you are. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, every creative person has inspiration. Um, they're what I call um, their butterflies, the scientist butterfly, <laughs> the thing that drives the thing. Um, I think that it's not necessary for that driver to be literal. Um, I think that when you start to uh, want that to be completely literal, it, you have problems. But I think that in, in the sort of the creative inspiration of anything is the spark which kind of drives a project and kind of gives you some, maybe it's a mimetic, slightly relational kind of positioning with things which drives the creativity. You know, the thing is what drives the creativity? What makes it creative? For you, what, how do you push? And for me, um, I started to realize that I had a very strong um, relationship to these forms because I'd known them my entire life. Um, and that actually, they actually, as much as I wanted to think that they were just part of a certain sensibility part in my subconscious, that they were very much part of my conscious kind of operation, but I just didn't bring language to it. So, like, in any influence that you have, if it's the Greek, if you live in Greece, or a Japanese context that you live in that you don't talk about, it's there, <laughs> right? And so you can either reference it, but it's always there working. You, you don't, just because you say it, it's not there, it doesn't mean it is. You're just the sum of the things that you're seeing in the world, reproducing them again in your own way, maybe, right? <laughs> David, thank you for a wonderful lecture. <laughs>